the question we're asking is, as Lavi alluded to in the middle or the beginning, what the hell is hell? So what the hell is hell? You heard it here first, Les. What is hell? By, by that I mean, what is the purpose of hell? So if hell's a thing and you're not going to dismiss it, then what is it? And more importantly, why is it? And of course, as always, all of today's notes from the Bible app by Version. If you haven't already downloaded the app, go into your app store, Version Bible app, click on more, click on events. There's a whole bunch of content. I won't be able to get to all of it, but it's all there for you to study later, including all of the sources from today's talk. So what I want to do uh, to answer this question is I want to give you two main points. We'll spend like 15% of my time on the first one and the majority on the second one. The first main point is this. What the hell is hell? Well, number one, Jesus did not avoid hell. He announced it. This is really important. Why? Because there's this you know, worldview or this opinion out there that, you know, if we could just unhinge the New Testament from the Old Testament, if we could like eject the Old Testament God with all the rules and regulations and all the difficult texts and all that kind of stuff, then what we'd have is this really lovey-dovey kind of hippie, new agey kind of Jesus faith. I mean, because right, all, because all the references of hell are all in the Old Testament. Uh -uh, incorrect. The majority, the vast majority of what we understand with the doctrine of hell actually came from Jesus. Nobody taught more explicably or clearly about the subject of hell than Jesus himself. Here's some stats. 13% of Jesus' entire teaching was devoted to hell, and over one half of his parables mentioned or alluded to hell in some kind of way. So if we think that somehow we can rescue Jesus from the Old Testament and embrace him as some lovey-dovey, pain-free way out of difficult conversations, we're wrong. Jesus did not avoid hell. He's the one that announced it. And again, this is why, back to our renowned atheist friend Bertrand Russell, he said, there is one serious defect to my mind in Christ's character, and that is he believed in hell. So even Russell, after studying scripture, has come to the conclusion that one of the reasons why he personally or people can't pervasively embrace Christ is even though he has so many great things going for him, healing people, you know, for, you know, he's always looking for the loner and the down and out, and he's always the God of the underdog, and all these wonderful themes, bottom line is we have to reject him because... He believed in hell. Let me just give you some scriptural examples. In Matthew 25 and verse 41 to verse 46, Jesus talked about how in the end, evil will be eternally punished while the righteous will receive the reward of eternal life. In Matthew 8, 12, Jesus said, some will be thrown into darkness where there'll be constant weeping and gnashing of teeth. Like, it'll be so bad, people will grit uh, and grind their teeth. Doesn't sound very lovey-dovey to me. Mark chapter 9, verse 43 to 48, it says that if your hand, if your right hand caused you to sin, better to Cut it off and cast into hell and to lose your whole body to hell. The point is this. The point is that we cannot have a Christian gospel. We cannot have a Christian message without Jesus and what he believed, very important, what he taught us about hell. In order to eject hell from the Christian message, we must reject Jesus. Because the two are one, we cannot have a Christian gospel without Jesus, and we cannot have a Jesus without hell. And I'm going to explain some more about what I think Jesus means by hell in a few minutes. But the point is, we can't talk or escape or edit or skip over certain passages just because it's convenient and easy. So Jesus did not avoid hell, he announced it. Second then point to answer the question, here's where I spend most of our time, uh, what is hell, is we have to understand that we avoid hell because of our assumptions about it. Most of us in this room, if I were to do a, a survey right now, mo like 95% of what most of us believe about hell is not accurate according to the biblical narrative. Like we have these uh, popularized notions of hell. Like for example, hell is the devil's home like where he lives, crazy, that you know everyone who goes to hell will be equally punished, also crazy, and that hell is a good place for people who don't like God, Christians in the church, 
also crazy. And some of us, as we think about even mental images of hell, there's, you know, episodes of The Simpsons flashing through your mind, South Park, if you're raised like me. I mean, there's all sorts of images in your mind, and that's fine, but they're not accurate to what Jesus, our scripture, teaches us about hell. So what I want to say to you is, more than likely, the reason why we avoid it uh, is because we have assumptions, and there's four particular assumptions that I want to get into. And this is very important. Why? Because if you, if you want to be an intellectual being in the world, a sentient being, you have to be, understand that you cannot afford to be naive when it comes to your own cultural assumptions. Like, we like to think we're objective thinkers. We like to think we come to issues and, and, and you know, political questions and religious questions and moral questions as a blank slate. But the truth is, our worldview, the filter, the lens through which we interpret information has been crafted and shaped by the world that we live in. If if you grew up like me in Ireland, if you grew up in the Western world in particular, we have a pervasive worldview, a filter that affects everything we see. It's like someone wearing a different shade of sunglasses. The darker the shade, the less light you see in a sense. And the same way we have a shade, we have a filter over our eyes, over our mind, through which we interpret things. It's not wrong, but it is naive of us to think that we can tackle such questions being truly objective because we're not. And the second thing I want to say before I jump into these is that therefore we need to be self-aware regarding where our worldview comes from and where our bias sides when it comes to difficult questions. Because as we're going to see, there are certain parts of hell that, uh, from our assumptions that are repulsive to us, but actually in other cultures make total sense. And I'll explain that more in a second. So I want you to be aware that you today, like me, we all in this room and online, we approach every question of faith, meaning, and life, not from an objective, purely objective standpoint, but through the cultural lens from the world in which we live. So, so from that then, what are the four kind of major assumptions people have against hell? Number one, people say hell is repulsive. Number two, hell is unjust. Number three, hell is excessive. And number four, I mean, hell is just downright abusive. I mean, come on. I mean, how could you ever embrace a Christian God that would cause people, as we heard Bertrand Russell say, to suffer in hell forever? And again, maybe these are some of your pushbacks there. Maybe if you're a Christ follower, you've wondered about some of these things. So we're going to jump in and see how it goes. Number one, hell is repulsive. Now, this is different to the other subject matters that we've covered, where we've talked about, you know, um, you know, things being, you know, thoughts or truths or theories or, or principles that I don't agree with, you know, that we can differ on intellectually. Hell, ha hell brings in this emotional side to it. Like, when we think about the possibility of reality hell, there's this sense of disgust, like it's, it's not just that I doubt its existence, it's that it's repulsive. Hell is repulsive. I mean, just the, the very fact that good people or decent people can end up in a place like hell, that's just a repulsive thought to me. But again, I want you just to pause and remember what I just said, just because hell is repulsive to our current cultural worldview doesn't mean it's repudiated. Just because we don't like it doesn't mean it can't be defended and rationally explained. And it doesn't mean certainly it's not true. The basis for truth cannot be just because you like or don't like something. I mean, imagine living in a world where truth is decided by what the most influential person in the room likes or doesn't like. I would call that another form of hell. You know what, right now, Ukraine is in hell. You know why? Because one man decided he didn't like something. And it became truth. And now hundreds of thousands of people are suffering because of it. So we know, come on, even in our Western world, that truth cannot be based on what I like or don't like, what makes me comfortable and uncomfortable. Truth must be anchored to something deeper, something real. Now again, it doesn't mean we still don't feel when it comes to hell. I know when I first became a Christ follower many years ago, I gave my life to Jesus and I started following him and I was the first person in my family to step out and follow Jesus and that was great and God did wonderful things in my life. But I remember for the first couple of years, I mean, I, I would toss and turn some nights in bed struggling, wrestling with the reality of hell because as I understood it, I, I have now decided to hitch my wagon to Jesus, so to speak. I'm following him and I believe in him and I trust him, but he talks about this place that people go if they don't trust him too. And I remember thinking, man, that's my mother, that's my father, that's my brother, that's my granny. Jesus, don't throw my granny in hell. 
I mean, come on, somebody. I mean, what kind of God is this? And so I would toss and turn, and I would, and I would wrestle with the reality of how. I just, I just, it was just repulsive to me even at that time to think that God could do such a thing. But again, my disgust or my dislike of it didn't make it wrong. Just like, for example, my disgust or dislike of Costa Coffee, hello, doesn't make it wrong. Just because I prefer Starbucks and I would try to sell it to you for free, no one has to pay me anything to try to convince you to buy Starbucks over Costa. No offense to anyone who loves Costa in the room. Um, but just because I like it, just because I love it, just because I believe it's true, doesn't mean it is true with a capital T. And we know this intuitively. It was Mark Clark that said, the doctrine of hell, and he says the same thing. He was shocked by it. Uh, but I realized the objections I had were cultural ones, born out of sensibilities and ideas I held because I was a 21st century white, middle class, educated uh, Westerner with the accompanying, accompanying perks that I am not even aware of at times. You see, what feels right is not a good mechanism to find truth. What feels right isn't the best way to find truth because what feels right to one person might feel not right to another. And again, it might make great movie scripts, but it's awful for moral standards. It might seem great for people to you know, have a feeling and the feel and that we follow the characters of the movie and their feeling is proved true. And we all go, yay, that's what you call a hero in narrative terms. But in reality, that really sucks. For example, uh, the other night I was watching Ace Ventura. Anyone remember Ace Ventura? Come on, love Ace Ventura. Jim Carrey's a legend. And there's this scene where like Ace Ventura is like chasing the bad guy, but he's running over people. And have you ever wondered like, is the damage caused by the hero and chasing the bad guy were you worth less than the bad guy? Like it seems like a lot of people get injured in these action movies and a lot of properties destroyed for the sake of, well, I mean, we, didn't, we didn't even see it because they're background characters, right? It's like, oh, who cares about them? We're all about the bad guy. But it's like, what if that was your daughter yeah. or your granny? It's like, hang on a second, like surely there's a more responsible way for Batman to get around and catch the Joker than blowing up innocent people, right? See, so you see, it works great on, on a movie screen but it's bad for the moral standards of reality. We need to be aware of our culturally formed assumptions because they shape what we see. So hell is repulsive because of our Western worldview. Number two, hell is unjust. And again, when we say hell is unjust, what we usually mean by this is, let me try to articulate as well. We, we mean that the correction doesn't fit the crime. Like, okay, so hands up, we've done some things, we've not been wise, not been good, we've been naughty little boys and girls, you know, we're on the naughty list, you know, and Santa's coming, and it's funny how no one ever stays on the naughty list, if you wonder about this, like, no one I've ever met has ever actually got a bag of coal at Christmas, it's like, what's the point of the naughty list in reality, I think our kids are catching on to this stuff, but it's like, man, I've done some things wrong, and it's bad for sure, but like, it's not that bad, I mean, it's not like I've murdered anybody, or stolen anything, or invaded a country. I mean, like, compared to other people, I think I'm doing okay. And so when we think about hell, we think, man, hell is unjust because the punishment is too severe for the crime committed. Such a heavy-handed approach from God, we say, doesn't make sense. It's just not fair. It's not fair that people who are decent, morally good, not so bad when compared to other people, go to a place and are punished for a temporary, temporarily or temporary time of crime. And again, many Christians struggle with this and try to find other explanations. Two of the major pushbacks Christians will give or two of the ways Christians will try logic their way out of this is annihilism and universalism. And annihilationism is a belief that yes, in the end, good people go to heaven, Bad people go to hell, but then God is going to destroy everyone in hell and they'll, and they'll suffer forever. I mean, it's like, it's a good out. Like, you know, they'll go there for a while, but then God will just end it. Like, like almost like a divine spiritual euthanasia. Like they'll go for a while, but then God will end their suffering. It's annihilationism. Universalism on your hand says, this is very popular with a lot of TV people in particular. I won't name anyone, but like you'll see it. It's the belief that at the end of the day, all rivers flow into one sea. 
I mean, it doesn't matter if you're Christian or if you're Muslim or if you're Buddhist or if you're New Age. It doesn't matter if you're Charles Manson and you kill millions of people. It doesn't matter what you do, who you are, who you abuse, what you take, who you hurt and who you kill. Because in the end, right, we all flow into the same ocean. Well, that's okay if you're a white middle-class Western with no, where your biggest problem is you can't get your Instagram feed to work because the internet's not working. That's bad if your daughter was raped and killed by a murderer and she has to spend the same eternity in the same sea with the same person that murdered her. Right? I mean, it, it works fine in conversation, but as we use rationale and logic and follow that, mystical stream into the mystical ocean wherever where all dogs go to heaven live happily ever after it's like hang on i don't want to be in that kind of place that's not fair you think you think christian value is not fair a place where everyone gets to go anyway no matter who they are that's even more not fair right and again this is the luxury of a mindset afforded to us especially in the western world our prevailing culture says it cannot embrace God because hell is not fair. When many other cultures will say they couldn't embrace God without hell because that's not fair. Because if you live in a non-Western part of the world where there's no law, there's no police coming to help you, if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, a child in somebody's parts of the world, you have no rights, you have no defense, there is no justice. How could you ever embrace a God that would allow the people that abused you and your family to one day live in paradise? If such a God even existed, would you ever consider following him? In the Western world, because we're all good people, yes. But in other parts of the world where people are murdered and raped and stole from and abused every single day, no way, man. I can't follow a God who allows evil people to get away with the evil they've done. In some perspectives, not having judgment for evil, hell, is as unjust as our Western perspective of it being unjust because people, we think, are, are inherently good. And again... Think about what we talked about in week one, about our last week even in the hypocrisy message. And week one, we talked about like the last 50 to 60 years. I mean, Paul Potts, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin. I mean, all these people, are they all going to end up in heaven too? Because in their heart, they believe, they felt like what they were doing was true and right. And if not, then what gives you say? Are you now God? You can choose who does and doesn't. You think, well, I get in and be granny because we're good. But those other fellas, oh, no, no, because they're bad. I mean, what is the, the moral standard? What is, what is the ticket required, if there was a ticket, to get in and out of these places? You see, it was uh, Miroslav Wolf, who is a, he's a Croatian theologian, who witnessed the destruction of his country, said, it takes the quiet of a suburban home for the birth of the thesis, the thesis we're talking about. God's refusal to judge. In a scorched land, soaked in the blood shall be of the innocent, it will invariably die. And as one watched it die, one will do well to reflect about many other pleasant captivities of the liberal mind. You think people in Ukraine right now can embrace a God who won't fight for their justice? A God who would allow the people who are doing what's been done to their people to all of a sudden one day get into heaven because they thought they were doing the right thing. And I get it because here's the bottom line. As human beings, we are, we are hardwired for justice. We are hardwired for justice and we are intrinsically anti-injustice. Like we, something in us understands that justice is important and we should fight for justice. And, you know, evolutionary biologists will say, well, that, that, that belief, that conviction evolved over time because of no justice, we'd all just run wild and kill each other. But I believe that that sense, that, that, that homing beacon of value within us is, is the residue of the fingerprint of God. That he is a just God and he created originally a just universe and that he calls us to be just beings. And so the, the sense of unjustness that we feel against our assumptions about hell are well founded. But here's the truth. For justice to work in the world, our world practically speaking, and in God's world metaphysically speaking, there must be accountability. It is no accountability there's no justice. At the end of the day, someone must pay. At the end of that day, someone must pay. Otherwise, 
There's no justice. Something in us says, well, injustice is wrong. And what we don't, we don't realize is hell from a Christian perspective is all about accountability and justice. That ultimately, if God is a just judge and if God's created a just universe, there must be consequences to the choices people make. Now we can discuss and we must and we can you know debate what the consequences should be or what our personal view of the of the choices are. But in God's eyes, ultimately, sin, as we're going to see, is a crime against God. And like crimes in the human world, crimes in the metaphysical world cannot go unpunished. There must be consequences for crime for justice to exist. Otherwise, there's no justice. Again, back to Miroslav Wolf. Is it not worthy of God to wield the sword or to judge? Is God not long-suffering and all-powerful love? A counter-question can go something like this. Is it not a bit arrogant to presume that our contemporary sensibilities about what is compatible with God's love are so much more healthier than those of the people of God throughout the entire history of Judaism and Christianity. In other words, what he's saying is that we need, we, need do, we, need, we need to do a reality check and make sure that we're not trying to impose on the conversation of hell our Western sensibilities. Because if you grew up in a disadvantaged or war-torn part of the world, if you, like this uh, professor, witnessed the destruction of his home country, like the Ukraine is doing right now, you would have a different, perhaps, perspective on many of these Questions. In other words, as, Mi as uh, uh, Miroslav Wolf says, if God is truly just in the justice sense, then hell is necessary. Because if God is just and everybody gets into heaven anyway, what kind of justice is that? And again, if you're good and all your friends are good, that makes sense. But if you've suffered, if you've been on the receiving end of malevolence, of evil, of abuse, of torture, of, of people stealing from something from you, from you that can never be gotten back, then something in you says there must be justice in this world, outside this world, for people like that. So hell is repulsive. Hell is just, the third pushback is hell is excessive. So even if you're, say, you're saying to me, Jamie, even if I'm willing to go with you on this journey, even if I'm willing to go, okay, I can see from that perspective that maybe hell isn't as just unjust as I thought, theoretically speaking, it is a bit excessive. I mean, come on. I mean, like, the pushback that many of us have here is based on the idea that if a person sins for seconds and then is spent eternity as a result of their transgression, isn't that excessive? Mark Clark says, however, the degree to which a person experiences punishment is not typically based on how long it takes to commit a crime, but on the seriousness of the crime and the weight of the offense. In other words, it seems comfortable and convenient for us to apply to hell this view that it's not fair, it's not just, it's a bit excessive that if I sin for a few seconds, if I, if I step outside God's ordained purpose of the world and I do things my way at the cost of my own health, well-being or someone else's, whether it's you know, something moral or something evil, like you know whatever it might be, stealing, whatever, then how, how is it, is it not excessive that I spend the entire rest of eternity in hell? To which... Clark says, well, that's, that's not, that might seem convenient in a theological conversation, but let's be honest. Again, if someone murdered someone you loved and it only took 10 seconds to do it, does that mean they get 10 minutes in jail or 10 hours or 10 days or even 10 years? No, the way justice works in the world is the, pun the punishment that is given out in a just system is based on the weight of of the offense and the value of the one who is offended. I mean, if I go out and I'm very sorry for the cat lovers here and shoot someone's cat, or I shoot multiple cats, I'm a genocidal maniac when it comes to cat killing people. Let's say I kill a hundred cats. I mean, terrible as it may be, I might end up in jail and I might end up there for a few years. Okay, so the weight of the offense, and again, if you're a cat lover, you might disagree with that. That's the way it is. But if I kill people, how many of that changes? Why? Because even though the offense is the same, murder, the value of a person is worth so much more than the value of a cat. And if you're a cat lover, that is true. I'm sorry, okay? I know you think we're kind of equals. We're not. Humans matter more. So, so we know this. This is how our world 
works. And again, it takes seconds to murder someone, but it leads to a lifetime of lockup. And again, if you're a parent, you understand this because even though hopefully our kids aren't running around murdering cats or people, you know, they are at times disobedient and healthy parenting needs to establish healthy boundaries for kids. Telling kids they can have whatever they want, whenever they want, the way they want, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is not healthy parenting. Kids need boundaries. Children need to be told no and no and no. And you think you can exhaust me, son? You don't know what I'm made of. I can go for days. It's going to be no. And even my worst hour, even when I'm stressed, even when the baby's crying, even when the dog is putting the floor, even when it's chaos, it'll still be no. Because our parenting isn't based on feelings alone, but on convictions. Now, when it comes to discipline, kids, you know, there, there's a, in every home, there should be anyway, but normally there is even, even intuitively, a hierarchy of punishments, right? Because if my child, one of them, let's just, I won't pick, I won't pick a name, because they're all equally sinful in my eyes, um, <laughs> lovingly so, but, but, but let's just say one of them punches their brother. Turns around, wax the butter. He's like, oh, I did that, da, da, da. You know, usually as a parent, what's the, what, what, what do we normally do? Two boys, one hits the other one. We used to say, hey, say, sorry. Okay, let's just say they punch the baby. Or worse, punch the mother. I've told my kids, I love you, but I love your mother more. You touch her, I kill you, I can make more where you came from. <laughs> That's for free, everybody. There's one queen in our house, man, and she rules the roost, and I'm, and I'm there to make sure of it. <clears throat> so if I send my kid to the step or to his room as a punishment, there's different degrees. If they sin against each other, it's a certain level of punishment. If they sin against their father or mother, right, it's a different kind of punishment. We punish people based on the value of the person, the entity of the person we sinned against. This is what the theologians call a scale of essence. And, you know, one of the reasons why we struggle with the subject of hell is because we struggle with the subject of sin, which should be a conversation on another day. But as Martin Luther said, he called it homo incurvatus, which basically means humanity turned in on itself. When we're allowed to become selfish, self-centered beings, when we're turned in on ourselves, so to speak, it doesn't do us any good or the world around us. And somewhere, somehow, there must be consequences for selfish and self-centered choices. Even if you believe you're right, even if you, be, even if you believe you deserve to be right, doesn't change the fact that there must be a moral standard somewhere. And, if, and, and ultimately what I'm saying is that an offense against God, which is sin, requires just punishment. And as unpalatable as it still may be, what scripture teaches us is that the just punishment of a sin against God is hell. It's hell. And again, you think, man, that, that, that's, I mean, but it's still excessive because if I say live a good moral life, which is one go-to we always use in the Western world, because we love to define what a good moral life means, you know, and your good moral life is good for you, but maybe bad for others, because maybe you think it's good to sleep around and take a, a, you know, advantage of people, but maybe they and their future spouse don't. Hey, but it's a free world. You do, you do, I do, I do, and we'll all be happy ever after, but we're not. It doesn't work. There has to be standards, and even in the judicial system, there has to be standards of morality. Otherwise, you can't judge people accordingly. In the same way, if God is the creator of the universe, that same truth must exist right to the core of human existence. And even though we get to define for ourselves what morality is of ourselves, the truth is sin against God, a persistent refusal to submit and come to God, is a crime against God, and therefore a crime is deserves consequences, the consequences of hell. Which you go, well, if I was just a, a moral person and didn't choose to follow Jesus, it's not fair, there it is again, that I have to suffer in the same way people like Stalin and Hitler and all these other evil people did. And the truth is, that's not true. Hell will not be the same for everyone. It's a complete misconception. There will be different, just like there's differing and varying degrees of rewards in heaven, There'll be differing and varying degrees of punishment in hell. God is not crazy. God is not stupid. God created this thing like he created the world with intentionality. And in the same way, you know, uh, if, if you were caught jaywalking and someone was caught murdering, you're not going to get the same punishment. You end up in the same place, perhaps, if the full letter of the law is applied. 
but you're not going to end up to the same degree. In the same way, not everyone suffers in hell. Mark Clark says, in fact, almost every time the Bible describes final judgment, it says that a measure of punishment or reward will be exercised based on what a person has done in his or her life. And again, here's a couple of scripture examples, not in your notes, you're writing down. Matthew 11, 21, Luke 12, 47, John 5, 28, Matthew 5, 25, 32, and Revelation 20, 12. I mean, there's a whole bunch of scriptures there, in the, sorry, the are the notes, not on the screen, that you can look at later, that give you examples of this uh, point. Again, because we think, well, if, if, if I go to hell and I'm in hell, well then, what happens if I change my mind? What happens if I decide to be a good person? The truth is, another misconception of the excessiveness of hell is the idea that when people get there, they'll stop sinning. But it's not what scripture portrays. Scripture shows, like for example, in Luke 16, that sin never stops. Just because people sin on earth and go to hell doesn't mean all of a sudden they're punished to become good people. Sin continues in hell. Hell is the result. Hell is the reward for people who think sin is better than surrender to Jesus. If you live your life in a direction, homo incurvatus, if you live your life inwardly for yourself and of yourself, for your own pleasure and goodwill, the result of that path according to scripture is you will get exactly what you want. Not just deserve, what you desire. You think, I don't desire that. Yes, you do. Because hell is a place where sin rules. That's what rules your life right now. What makes you think if you one day get there, that all of a sudden you change your mind if you won't change it now? Sin never stops. In fact, it was the philosopher G.K. Chesterton who said, hell is actually a great compliment to the reality of human freedom and the dignity of human choice. Hell is God's compliment to human autonomy. The idea that just because one day you may end up something you don't like doesn't mean you're going to change your value system, change your worship system, or change your faith position. You're going to continue in all probability in the way you've lived all your life before that point. It was D.A. Carson who said, hell is not a place where people are consigned because there were pretty good people who didn't believe the right stuff in their 80 years. No, they're consigned there first and foremost because they defy their maker and want to be the center of their own universe. Hell is not filled with people who've already repented. Only God isn't gentle enough or good enough to let them out. No, hell is filled with people who for all eternity still want to be the center of their own universe. So what has God to do? If he says it doesn't matter to him, then God is no, no longer a God to be admired. For him to act in any other way in the face of such blatant defiance would be to reduce God himself. In other words, what's he saying? He's saying that God's great comment to human autonomy and free will is that if you choose to live your life desiring to be homo incurvatus, turned in and all about yourself, then basically hell is the fulfillment and the final destination of that path. Like we said back in September, you know, it, what, what de determines our direction? Our destination, sorry. Direction, not intention, determines our destination. You could say, oh, I'm full of good, uh, you know, uh, uh, good intentions, but ultimately what determines where we go isn't our intentionality, but the direction in which we are traveling. God allows us the freedom of choice, but God has to be just to be God. Otherwise, reduce God to nothing because who wants to follow or serve a God who isn't God enough to follow through on justice? So hell is excessive only according to our measurement of what morality deserves. Number four, and lastly, hell is abusive. And again, this is a good one because this is usually the easy one to pick on because this refers to the idea that hell is a torture chamber. Okay, uh, and again, some of the uh, you know saw at the beginning. Some of the skeptics pushbacks is why is hell characterized by torture? It was Charles Templeton, who used to be a Christian evangelist and later became an atheist, who said, "I couldn't hold someone's hand to a fire for a moment. How could a loving God, just because you don't obey Him and do what He wants, torture you forever, not allowing you to die?" but to continue in that pain for eternity. There is no criminal who would do this. And again, we, we read them and go, actually, yeah, there's a bit of truth. I mean, I, 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 can, I can understand why people, maybe I, maybe you, you push back, go, that is, that is kind of somewhat abusive. 
It reminds me of a story a couple of years ago. I was uh, in the great country of Romania, uh, driving through the countryside there, and I came across this beautiful Orthodox church. Here it is from the distance. And it was so beautiful, I wanted to stop the car and take a photo of it, which I did. And just beautiful, you know, paintings and structure, and it just was a beautiful thing to look at. And as I got closer, I realized that here in the main arteries to which the entrance into the church comes, you know, they've painted a very vivid, powerful, freakish, ghoulish, horrifying painting of what they think hell looks like. And I don't know if you can see it from far away, but like literally people being dipped in boiling water. They've been chased by demons. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm standing there going, what the heck is, like, could you just want to put welcome in Romanian? Like, it's good to see you. Like, there's hope in this place. Like, of all the things the church can say to people as they come through, it's what happens to you if you don't listen. I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, like, that's not the best way to kind of win people over people, you know? And I was, it was such a shame because it was so elaborate and so beautiful. And of all the things someone could paint, of all the things of beauty and nature and of God, really, we choose this? And again, you stand there, and even I, a Christian pastor, look at this thing and I go, if that's what God does to people, God's not a savior, he's a sadist. Because how could God, any God, derive pleasure from the suffering and torture of human beings, even if they're quote-unquote sinners. But again, this is, this is where our misconceptions come into play because that is, a, what I believe, a biblical misconception. Again, I've done a lot of research on this, and when we think about books like Revelation or prophetic books or apocalyptic books, as they're called in Scripture, to completely understand or comprehend it, we must pay attention to what's called literary context. Literary context. We all know the difference, or we used to anyway, between what was a news flash and social media posts. The problem in our world right now is fake news, right? Like, what can you believe? But there used to be a day where, depending on something's source, its context, it could be taken to be true. Whereas something else, if it's in a comic book, or if it's on TV, or in a, in a soap opera, or a drama, it's taken as comedy, or comic relief, or acting. The problem right now is our world is going through this incredible mismatch of things. We don't know what's true, what's not, what's not. But when it comes to the scripture, there are literary contexts. And most of the scripture that explains hell, or most of the references that explain hell in scripture are what's called apocalyptic, where we get the word apocalypse, which all that means is in the end. Apocalypse means in the end. Okay, so apocalyptic in the end, after the age. And, and, and in most cases, the literary context of apocalyptic literature is metaphorical. For example, did you know that there's probably going to be no fire in hell? I mean, every reference I've ever seen of hell always has fire or lava or something. Well, fire was common language for judgment, such as Genesis 19.2, 2 Kings 1, Ezekiel 38. Again, it was, it was a metaphorical point that was designed, a metaphorical imagery, an apocalyptic imagery, imagery that was designed to make a theological point. Much of what we think we know about hell just isn't true. N.T. Wright, the theologian, he said this, he said, the different layers of meaning in vision literature of this type demand to be heard in their full polyphony, okay, in the, in the, in the full layer of sound that they come with, not flattened into a single level of meaning. If this had been noted a century ago, biblical scholarship could have been spared many false trials, he says. Apocalyptic language uses complex and highly colored metaphors in order to describe one event in terms of another. Indeed, it is not easy easy to see what better language system could have been chosen at the time. The metaphorical language of apocalyptic invests history with theological meaning. Again, one of the bre best and brightest theological minds on the earth right now. What's he saying? He's saying, ultimately speaking, much of what was available to the writers who wrote the, the Gospels and the Scriptures and the Bible it was, was highly metaphorical imagery to kind of drive home the theological point. We, however, read, and from a misconceived view, apply literal understandings to metaphorical images. And again, like I said, we should get this because you don't, you don't go out today and go by a news agent and buy a copy of a comic book and go, oh my gosh, aliens are invading. Oh no, someone save us. You don't walk out of a movie screen and go, oh my gosh. I mean, it is out there and it's all going to catch us 
you know, it's Halloween. Like we understand that in certain contexts, information not real. But it used to be that if you read a newspaper, you could look at it and go, okay, this is trustworthy information. Again, I remember for me, before I became a Christ follower, I used to be a huge Nirvana fan. Um, and the first ever CD that I ever bought in my life was Nirvana Unplugged in New York. And I bought the album, went home, put it in. And if, I was, if I'm honest, I was a bit disappointed because I didn't realize it was an acoustic album. I, I learned to love it later on. And one of the songs in, on the album, uh, Nirvana cover, I do a cover of a song called Lake of Fire. And in this song, Kirk Cobain sang his rasp, raspy voice, you know, he goes, where the bad folks go when they die? Don't go to heaven where the angels fly. Go to a lake of fire and fry. We'll see you again to the 4th of July. That's I'm a drummer, by the way. And when I became a Christ follower, I had to realize so much of what I think about hell came from a Nirvana song. Not the Bible, a, a cover that one band did of another, which who knows their source, but my view of hell was like God's going to throw people into a lake of fire so they can fry. This is terrible. And you're going to see him again. And if, like, do we understand that even the song is metaphorical? Yes. We're not going to see dead, sinful people on the 4th of July being shot into the sky like fireworks. That's crazy, people. We know this. The problem is we don't often apply it to Scripture. It was G.K. Beale, a biblical scholar, who said, the lake of fire into which Satan and his angels are thrown, Revelation 20.10, is not literal. Since Satan, along with his angels, are spiritual beings. The fire is a punishment that is not physical, but spiritual in nature, because Satan himself isn't a physical being. And again, those are the words of a biblical scholar. And again, despite the genre being metaphorical, there is a sense in where doesn't mean the realities aren't true that Dr. Timothy Keller says all descriptions and depictions of heaven and hell in the Bible are symbolic and metaphorical. Each metaphor suggests one as aspect of the existence of hell. For example, fire tells of, of, tells of disintegration while darkness speaks to isolation. Having said that, that does not mean or imply that heaven them, and hell themselves are metaphors. They are very much realities, but all language about them is elusive, metaphorical and Partial, some may conclude. Well, if that's the case, hell isn't, if hell is just a symbol, then it isn't so bad. And that's where we missed the point. The point is that the characteristics, the descriptors of hell that we find are symbolic, but hell itself is not. In fact, most of the pictures we find in the Bible are pictures of a reality, not less, but more than the real metaphor. In other words, it seems like hell will be worse than what's often described in reality. Again, we get this because think about the example of a wedding ring. You know, if you get married and you put a wedding ring in someone's hand, the wedding ring is a metaphor that symbolizes the reality, right? If you lose your wedding ring, you don't lose your marriage unless you lose it intentionally. <laughs> and just because you've bought yourself a wedding ring doesn't mean you're married. So sad. Um, <laughs> nothing against wearing wedding rings on the wrong finger. But I'm just saying, they're just symbols of a greater reality. In the same way, like a wedding band is, 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 a, is something, I can, I, something I can get my head around, I can interact with my senses and speak to a greater reality, so are the symbols described in hell. C.S. Lewis said, when it comes to the conversation of hell, it's not about you, your wife or son, about Nero or Judas Iscariot, or about Elvis or Hitler or anyone else. It's about you and me. So, as we close then, so if that's what hell is, then the second half of the question is, why is hell this way? Why does hell have to be this way? And to, the answer to this question is found in asking another question. And here's the question. I want you to really pay attention because I'm going to bring this thing in for a close in a second. Why is hell this way? To answer that question, we're going to ask a much more profound question. That is this. What happens when you completely eradicate the existence of God? What happens to our world when we, when for those who are not believers, not Christ followers, maybe agnostic, what happens when we're successful in completing, in completely ridding ourselves of the existence of God? Well, to answer that question, we've got to ask the question, well, who or what is God? Well, we're told God is a source of all good. Well, what's good? Well, burgers are good. Music is good. Art is good. 
Nature's good. Beer is good. Can be used in unwise ways. Water's good. Laughter, the crack, is good. Pleasure is good. Sex is good. Any believers in the room today? I thought I'd be pretty much 100% in that one. So what happens when you remove the source of all that good from the world? Well, you get no sex, that's for sure. Our burgers. Our, let's go de deeper. Love. Laughter. Relationship. I mean, if we're going from the biblical narrative, God is a source of all these things. Hell, therefore, is the working out of our choice to experience total autonomy of God. Hell is a result of our desire, an autonomous choice to live in a world like God. We don't, we don't get to decide. We, don't, we, we can't demand of God what's his. If God has created all these things and they're of him and from him and to us, then when he takes them away from us because he respects our autonomous choice, then we can't complain because we don't own anything in this world. Right. We're stewards of it. You see, hell, at its essence, exposed the greatest lie in human history, and that is this, we don't need God. Yeah, maybe you think you don't need church or you don't need the Bible, but if God is the source of all things good, things that we love and enjoy, things that make life worth living and we want to get rid of those things, then what is life in essence? Again, back to our good old Irish friend C.S. Lewis. There is no other way to the happiness for which we are made. Good things as well as bad are caught by a kind of infection. If you want to get warm, you must, you must stand near the fire. If you want to be wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, power, peace, and eternal life, you, may, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. They're not a sort of prize which God just hands out to anyone. They are a great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. If you are close to it, the spray will wet you. But if you are not, you will remain dry. Once a man is separate from God... What can he do but wither and die? Hell, in other words, is the only option for an existence, a complete and total existence, without God. Make no mistake, as was said earlier, hell is not a victory in God's eyes, but a tragedy. For hell, watch this, it's going to blow your mind. For hell was not created for people. Hell was never intended for people. Read Matthew 25, verse 41. We're told that, that hell was created for the devil and for his demons. Again, we have this picture of hell being like the devil's HQ where him and all, you know, his homie demons hang out and plot evil and run amok. That's like the coolest place to be. Hell is not fun for the devil. Hell is punishment for him. And human beings were never designed to go to hell and hell was never designed for human beings. Wow. And even though, rough, not, even though humans are attended for hell, they're not impeded either. Why? Because God gave us the gift of free will, yeah. of free choice. And what that means is that nobody ends up in hell by accident. There's, there's going to be no one who, I don't have to wake up or just, come to kind of cognizant reality and realize I'm in hell. No one's going to go there like, oh no. Because I like they're like in a cave with the devil having a party. It's they're going to, it's they're going to continue to live in an existence without God. The closer they get to that reality, the, fur, the more things like beauty, love, laughter, friendship, nature, art, music, and food, even water fade away. What's so sad is when you read in one parable, the parable of Rich man Lazarus in Luke 16, even though there's no water in hell, there still is thirst. Hell was not created for people, but nobody ends up in hell by accident. It was J.P. Moreland, the philosopher, who said, hell is a place for people who, given what is needed to belong in heaven, that is submission to Jesus, do not want to go to heaven. Thus, 
hell is a natural experience of the choices people make. It is a monument to human freedom. See, even though we may not think it's fair because of our Western sensibilities, if God is just, and if he is the one that holds the standard of morality, he must choose what is good, what is bad, what is sin, what is obedience. Judgment is necessary for justice to prevail. And if God is not a God who's willing to judge, he's not a just God. And if God is not just, if God is not the justice with a capital J and holds together the entire universe, then he is not a God worth following. Again, one more time, Miroslav Wolf. God will judge, not because God gives people what they deserve, but because some people refuse to receive what no one deserves. If evildoers experience God's terror, it will not be because they have done evil, but because they have resisted to the end the powerful lure of the open arms of a crucified Messiah. Should not a loving God be patient and keep luring the perpetrator to goodness? But how patient should God be? The day of reckoning must come. Not because God is too eager to pull the trigger, but because every day of patience in a world of violence means more violence. And every postponement of vindication means letting insult accompany injure, injury. Again, who will punish the Hitlers and the Stalins and the Mao's world? I mean, every one of those guys outside Hitler died a peaceful death surrounded by whoever they were surrounded by, they were never brought to justice. Is that fair? I mean, if you kill 50 million of your own people, should you be allowed to go to heaven and be unpunished? Who has the last say in that regard? If God is truly just, then not only is hell necessary, but it's essential. And every moment of our lives, the truth is, we're either moving closer or further away from God. And again, that isn't, act we're not like, ships lost at sea with our sails up and we're victims of service. We make choices. And hell is, not, hell is not a trap to catch people. Hell is the fulfillment of a life lived outside God. As Lewis says, there are only two kinds of people. Those who say, thy will be done to God, or those who, whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All those are in hell because they chose it. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. I believe the damned are successful rebels until the end. They enjoy a horrible freedom which they have demanded. And again, our rejection of God becomes more than an opinion. Oh, my opinion of faith, my opinion on God, my opinion on Bible, but actually a definition for Lewis says one more time, in the long run, the answer to all those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out the past sins of the damned and at all cost to give them a fresh start, smoothing over every difficulty and offering every miraculous help? He has done so in Jesus. Are you asking God to forgive them? They do not want to be forgiven. Are you asking God to leave them alone? Alas, says Lewis, I'm afraid that is what he does. So if not hell, then what? Because here's what you can't do. You can't just say nothing. You can't just say, I don't know. Because there's something. Maybe something's nothing. That's okay. That's your faith position. But there has to be something. So if not a justice system that guarantees evil one day will be punished, in a time from where God constantly gives us day by day mercy to experience him and know him, where our curiosity doesn't offend him, but leads us to him, where intellect isn't slapped down because, no, 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 don't think, just obey, where even in our intellect and our rationale, we can still find truth with a capital T. And in that truth, we find hope and we find help and we find meaning then what else? What better suggestion do you have? Again, it's not a victory, it's a tragedy. God is patient and we're told time and time again, he wants no one to perish. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is patient. He says, he's, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand stones. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, 
but everyone to come to repentance. I think today as we pray, there's a couple of things we need to get clear in our mind. Number one is, a lot of our misconceptions about hell aren't biblical. They've come from South Park and The Simpsons and movies. And number two, we understand that even though we may not like the reality of hell, we do like justice. And we do have this strong sense, this innate sense that evil has to be punished at some point by someone. We might disagree on the dishing out of the punishment, but the idea that justice must exist is something we believe in. And hell, God is not a sadist. He's not enjoy the suffering of human beings. He sent his one and only son into the world to die so he wouldn't have to suffer. Hell was not created for people who don't believe in God. Hell was created for the enemy of God's most precious creation, humanity. He's the devil. But if we choose to follow his example, homo incurvatus, self-centered, turned in on ourselves, over ourselves and for ourselves, if we choose because we can, a life without God, that's fine. But what we will find is that direction leads us to a destination. We won't be surprised because it's not what we deserve, it's what we desire. It's what we really want. We want to live without God. But if you want more than that, and if you're curious, and if you're hungry, if you're searching, if God really is good and he's the creator of love, life, and laughter, and you want to get to know the source of that, as C.S. Lewis did and said, get close to the warmth of that fire, his presence, then every one of us in this room and online, we're only ever one prayer away from being close to God.